Welcome to PPL Experts. My name is Tom and I'll be presenting the general navigation for PPL on LACL course. This course is designed to give you an in-depth understanding on the theory required to pass the CAA theory exam for this particular topic. Despite this, own self-study, commitment and discipline will be required. This course is displayed in the form of a slideshow, which I'll be talking through. Please feel free to pause the recording at any point to either take a break or write down any notes. So why is navigation important? Why is it uh, irrelevant to us? Well, firstly, uh, from getting from A to B, so if we're transiting to a certain place, uh, the navigation is going to help us do that. Secondly, to avoid terrain, so knowing where we are and avoiding terrain that is possibly higher than us. Traffic avoidance, so if we know a, an area of congested airspace where there's a lot of aircraft normally, maybe near an airport or an airway, then uh, navigating to, away from that particular place is important. Economics, so flying from one place to another and uh, finding the most economical route to, to, of the way to get there. So the one that's going to save us the most fuel and the one that's going to help us get there for the cheapest. So an example of this is if we fly from Shanghai to New York, uh, if we fly over the poles, it's a much shorter route than if we fly the, uh, the latitude all the way around. So... Uh, in this instance, you can save a lot of money by knowing uh, the best way to, or the most efficient way to navigate to and from different places. And lastly, aviate to navigate communicate. You can see navigating is one of the fundamentals of actually flying a plane. As we fly the aircraft, uh, na navigation is one of the most important things that we need to uh, consider for a multitude of reasons. So what are you going to need for this um, slideshow or to do some navigation? So we need a UK chart, one in 500,000, the half mil scale. We need a ruler uh, with an appropriate scale on it to measure nautical miles. A square protractor for measuring degrees and headings. A scientific calculator. Markers, so uh, permanent uh, fine tip markers for drawing on our chart, pencils, and lastly, the most important thing P1 computer. Now, using this uh, computer, and there's, it hovers, features heavily within the PPL navigation exam. Okay, there's a lot of questions across quite a few different subjects which will. Uh, require you to use the CRP1 computer so it's important that we become familiar with it and look at the different functions of how to use it and we'll go through that during this uh, slideshow. There are different versions of the CRP so this this is a particular CRP1 if you have a CRP5 for instance don't matter it's exactly the same it's just a slightly bigger version of what you see there. As long as we've got some kind of flight computer to which we can uh, use and get familiar with in order to answer the questions that will be required later on. So now we're going to be looking at the shape of the Earth and the Earth is not actually spherical it's called an oblique spheroid which means it's slightly squashed at either pole so it's slightly uh, thinner than it is wide so to put that into context the diameter is 23 nautical miles less than the equatorial diameter. Now, because it's such a small amount, we can treat it as a sphere. Okay, so we will consider it as a sphere, but in practice, it's slightly um, squashed at, at both poles. Now, the Earth is rotating. It does one rotation every 24 hours, and the axis at that point, or the Earth rotates, is known as the geographical polar axis. And that axis runs through the true north and true south. So it's the northern point of the globe and the most southern point. So 
So reduced Earth um, in a scale form is considered a globe. So if we get a representation of what the Earth looks like and we scale it down to a physical object, it is called a globe. That's its technical name. A map is a representation or part of the Earth's surface. So it could be of a multitude of different sizes. So it could cover a very small area or a much larger area, but it's a representation of one region on the globe in detail of the ground. However, in aviation we don't use maps, we use something called charts. And charts have much more detail on them, and that makes us it makes it more useful for us in aviation. Okay, so we have special conditions on there which are relevant to aviation. We have nautical information as well and aeronautical information. So that's uh, different information which is more specific to aviation, which is not just a depiction of what's on the ground. Okay, so for instance, us in aviation, we have uh, airspace to worry about, uh, different aerodromes which are more relevant on there, and that's the difference between a map and a chart. It's taking a ground a representation and converting it into something that's applicable that we can use as aviators. Now we're going to look at some imaginary lines and the first one, we, first one we're going to look at is something called a great circle. Now these lines can't be seen uh, so we have to imagine them. So one example of something called a great circle is the equator. Okay, It's a line moving in a constant direction so it doesn't change in heading. So the, the equator is the largest one but if we want the distance between A and B and that if we draw a line between A and B that will always be referred to as a great circle. And it is a line that cuts each uh, latitude at exactly the same angle, so it never change its, changes its heading, it's always remaining the same. We also get small circles as well, and that's any circle that is basically not uh, considered a great circle. Okay, So if it doesn't cut through the same latitude at the same angle, it will be considered a small circle and it does not pass through the center of the sphere at any point. Okay, So it might be slightly higher up, uh, maybe at a higher latitude or a lower latitude. So now we're going to look at latitude and longitude. Now it's important to understand the difference between the two, as this will become very important later on uh, within general navigation. So first we're going to look at latitude. So first we get parallels of latitude, which are those horizontal lines that uh, run across the globe effectively. So if we get a parallel of latitude, they're considered small circles, and they are reference to the equator. And as we can see, the equator is a great circle. Now the latitudes are always parallel to the equator, so they're at equal distance all the way around. So the equator is considered at zero degrees latitude all the way up to the north or the south pole, which is considered 90 degrees. Okay, And obviously the higher we get, the colder it gets as well. Okay, So it's the coldest at 90 degrees latitude by the poles and the warmest generally at that zero degrees around the equator. The equator is the longest parallel latitude, so it's got the greatest circumference. And as we increase degrees latitude going north or south, the circumference or diameter of each parallel latitude will decrease. Obviously, the smallest at the at north, true north or south, at the poles. And uh, as we get close to the equator, that parallel latitude will increase in size. So now we're going to look at uh, longitude. So we've looked at latitude, which are those horizontal lines uh, parallel to the equator, and now we're going to look at longitude. And longitude are lines joining the pole to pole, and they are also known as meridians. What they do is they converge between, uh, they converge towards each pole. So at the pole, these lo long lines of longitude are the closest together. As they move away from the pole, they start to increase in distance apart until we get to the equator. 
at the equator, these line, lines of longitude are the greatest distance apart, to which they will start to get narrow again as they reach the other pole. Okay, so each line is considered a degree, and the prime meridian, which is the one that all reference is taken off, runs through Greenwich in London. Okay, so that's zero degrees. Every um, line, line of uh, longitude from this point onwards it's either east or west of that point, depending on how many degrees, but uh, the one that we always take reference of, or the zero degree uh, meridian, is through London. So if we know what longitude and latitude now is, so latitude is the angular position north or south of the equator, so those horizontal lines. And longitude is angular position east or west of the prime meridian. And if we know what each of these values mean, we can def determine our position. And what we can do is split it down into degrees. Okay, so either degrees north or south or degrees east or west, depending on whether we're working in longitude or latitude. So we can, uh, as I said, we split it down into minutes each degree. And one degree of longitude is equal to 60 minutes in time. Okay. So, for instance, we have Coventry Airport, which is 52 degrees north, and then it's, uh, then it's split down into minutes and then 22 seconds. Okay, and it's one degree west and then 28 seconds. Now, because we can split it down into degrees and minutes, not only is it 52 degrees, it's also considered 52 minutes. And after we've got the minutes, we've got seconds. Okay, so it's a next level of accuracy um, to pinpoint a particular position. So now we're going to look at calculating degrees and also calculating the distance between two separate parallels of latitude or longitude. Now when we talk about latitude and longitude, they're based on multiples of 60. So when we put them in a calculator, um, if we were to find the difference between two longitudes, for instance, it would we would minus one from the other. And it gives the example, if we're trying to find the difference between 52 minutes and 50 seconds and 50 minutes and 55 seconds uh, we would put the two values in the calculator and minus one from the other okay that would give us an answer uh, but there's a much more logical way to do it to find the difference between um, two latitudes or longitudes which will give us an answer which is more appropriate to what we're going to ultimately the question questions are going to ask us now because Latitudes and longitudes are based on multiples of 60 because because of 60 minutes. Uh, the answer it gives us there, 1.95, is not an answer that we can use because it's not a minute within an hour or a, or a second within an, a minute. So what we need to do is convert this number into a, into a figure that is representative of time or a multiple of 60. And there is a way that we can do this on our scientific calculator. And we'll look at that on the next slide. And the reason why our calculator does this is because it's assuming that the number is metric, so it's not uh, recognizing it as time, it's recognizing it as just a number. Okay, so what we want to do is let the calculator know that we're now dealing with time instead. So there's a very easy solution, uh, so we can let the calculator know. And most scientific calculators will have this function known as the DMS key. And you can see a, a zoomed in version of what it should look like on your calculator. If your calculator doesn't have this function, then it's advisable to get one that does have this function. Okay, most scientific calculators will uh, have that. Okay, so degree the DMS key it stands for uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. So suddenly we can transform a transform a value into time. So what we need to do is to input the uh, value we did before. So we type in the minutes first of all. 
So you can see on the calculator, 52 minutes, and then we press the DMS key, which will input the fact that it's a minute. Then we put the seconds, so how many degrees seconds we have, 